So just as a review, uh, we're talking about evaluation frameworks. Uh, this is a very general methodology. So it can be used for a lot of things. Uh, but so the flip side, there's sort of two sides to this. So one side, the pro side is that you can use it to evaluate uh, comparisons between lots and lots of different things, hardware, software, protocols, whatever. Uh, the flip side of that is that uh, it's not going to really help you with the detail. You still have to invent what the criteria is that you're going to evaluate uh, these different alternatives under and that type of thing. Um, so it still requires a lot of expertise, a domain expertise uh, to use it. Um, so it's a general methodology and it's for comparisons uh, between alternatives. And it's a simple chart, so you'll see the chart, what it looks like uh, this class. But what we're going to have is we're going to have rows. Rows are going to be the, so in our case, the password alternatives uh, that we brainstormed last class. Uh, and then the columns are going to be the criteria for which we want to compare them. So we want to say which one's better. Uh, it's not going to be a clear answer that one's better. Some are better in some scenarios. Some are better for other things. So what are those other things? What are the things that they're better at? Let's list all those out as columns, and then we'll do some sort of evaluation of it. Uh, so in particular, in a chart form, you might think of having kind of like an empty cell, meaning that it doesn't achieve this property that we want it to achieve. A half uh, means that it kind of achieves it. There's some caveats there. Full dot means it, it, it's not a problem it fully uh, achieves uh, whatever the criteria is. Okay. Uh, if you want to do a, a very thorough job at this, uh, what you need to do is you have to spend a lot of time defining your criteria. Okay. So what is the criteria? What exactly does it mean? Remember, always phrase it positively so that you want a full dot. You don't want an empty dot. The best outcome for you is the full dot. So that's usually just a question of phrasing. Um, and if you were to do this, say, I, we've asked this in, in terms of assignments. I'm not sure what the assignments will look like this year. But uh, what we expect is that you actually explain every dot. So every row, every column, you gave um, an empty dot, a half dot, a full dot. You have to say why. And it's easier to say why if you clearly said what that dot means. Okay. So if you say you have a criteria and you're like, if it gets a full dot if I see x, y, and z. Right? Then in your justification, you just have to say, well, I gave it a full because it has X, Y, and Z, or whatever the case may be. Okay? Uh, so making it very clear is, is important. Uh, you don't want to define the same criteria twice. Uh, so there's a few things that you can, you can sort of catch that. You'll see it in the chart because you'll have a column and another column, and the dots look the same all the way down. Uh, that's sort of an indication that maybe you've captured the same property twice, that there's really no difference uh, between these properties. Uh, sometimes you have a property where nothing gets anything other than an empty dot. That's actually okay. That's fine. Uh, what you're saying is that nobody is solving this problem. This is kind of like an unsolved problem. And sometimes that's the story that you want to tell. And so that's, that's not a, a bad outcome uh, to have. Okay. Uh, so let's do an example. Uh, so the example we chose is password alternatives. So we uh, talked about different things you might do other than a password. So we'll compare, we'll keep passwords around as kind of our baseline uh, comparison. Uh, we thought about biometrics. So I'll think of fingerprints, but it could be iris, it could be uh, face ID, whatever the case may be. A hardware token is a second factor authentication. So you still have a username, you still have a password. Now you have another thing that's giving you a random number. That random number is changing every time you log in. Maybe it's changing over time or you're pushing a button every time you log in. But the point is that it is updating uh, over time. And uh, so, so if I steal your password, I can't log in because I don't have this other number. So if I want to break into your account, now I have to seal both your password and I have to seal this token. If I have your password without the token, or conversely, if I have the token without the password, then I'm still locked out. Okay? So it's two-factor because I have to get two things from you. Okay? So that's usually better for, for uh, security, uh, but it could create usability problems. Now I only have one thing to lose. Right? If I lose one of the two things, then, then I'm stuck. Okay? Um, so that's why we don't have 100-factor authentication. We could have 100-factor authentication. 
but it's going to take a really long time to put all those hundred factors in and if you lose any one of them you're locked out and things like that okay uh, so these are things that we want to capture in our evaluation framework uh, password manager uh, so this is sort of you know you you eventually realize that you're not going to create a unique password that's high entropy good quality for 200 websites that's just not going to happen you're going to memorize them all and you're never going to write them down uh, so that's just an unrealistic expectation and so we need to compromise somewhere and so one way that we compromise is that we actually write them down okay and if we're going to write them down well why not write them down in the browser since that's where you're entering the password anyway then you don't have to actually type anything you can just autofill the password we can maybe throw a master password on top of it so if some random person sits down on our computer they don't necessarily get access to every single password that we have uh, because it's a machine chosen password it's going to be really random uh, high entropy that kind of thing uh, so that's good uh, for security as well. So this this looks like a good compromise. Personally, for me, out of this list, if I was going to choose one of these things, the password manager is what would be my preference. Um, but anyways, um, you could also think about uh, maybe not basing on passwords, but basing on cryptographic keys. So a crypto key is like a password. It's just, it's a little longer. It's a little more random. Uh, it's harder to memorize. So it's really something that you have. It's not something that you know. Uh, so you'll probably have it on a file on your computer. Uh, when the web was first, when it first came to be, people thought this is how you would log in. Okay, so if we go back to the 90s, people thought uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to have passwords, you're going to log in with this certificate that's on your computer. And browsers still have that like, kind of legacy software support for this where you can store certificates in your browser. And when you go to a website, it will be like, okay, which certificate do you want to use and uh, that kind of thing. So that didn't catch on. Um, but anyways, there, there are a few places like in enterprises and things like that where you might see this model uh, that's being used. Another thing that's kind of like a password manager, it's more like maybe kind of like a cloud password manager, is uh, instead of creating a new account where you have the need to create a new password, you just log into that account with an existing account. And all that needs is for the account uh, that you're logging in via to, to authorize it, to basically say, you know what, I'll, I'll let you log into any account um, so you have some new game that you just installed on your phone. You have a website like Facebook and Facebook is saying if the game sets up their APIs correctly, they can call us and we'll uh, vouch that you are the Facebook user that you are and that you're entering your password correctly. Okay. Why would Facebook do that? That seems like they're just sucking up a lot of traffic. They're providing a free service. You know, there's no benefit to them. Well, they're doing it because there is a huge benefit to them, which is they now know when you're playing games, when you're logging in, what you've installed, that type of thing. Okay, so they're getting data uh, as part of that exchange. They're getting behavioral information. And behavioral information as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So technically they're only seeing when you log in, so it's not super fine-grained. It's not like they get to see you play the game, yeah. right? Um, but, but anyways, it's, it's a lot of information, just knowing what you install, when you install it, what, what were you looking at right before you installed it? That might be something they could infer uh, if they have cookies and stuff. Uh, we'll talk about cookies later uh, on, on other websites. Yeah. Uh, the final thing is uh, graphical passwords. Uh, so the most common graphical password is the swipe pattern on Android uh, to unlock it. And so this is the exact same concept as a password. It's a secret. You memorize it. It's random. The only difference is instead of it being alphanumerical characters, uh, what it is is some picture, like some pattern. Uh, there's different ways that graphical passwords work. Uh, you could have a picture where you have to click on certain points in the picture in a certain order, and if you do it right, then it lets you in. Um, this has been more of a research topic, so researchers have looked at it. Psychologists like it. People with a psych background who have looked at it say it, it's more memorable, better recall uh, than an alphanumerical password. Um, but once again, it just didn't really catch on. Um, and so, yeah, anyways, uh, we'll, we'll consider that as an alternative. Yeah, please. Yeah, so that could be another kind of category. Uh, so it's maybe if you want to sh sort of shove it into something, it's kind of like single sign on. Like with single sign on, it's not like you literally give your Facebook password to Facebook. You log into Facebook, Facebook transfers a cookie via their API to the service that you're logging into. 
And so now they can, they know who you are. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. The, I don't know how to categorize it exactly. Yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. All right. So let's think of some criteria. Okay. So now we want to um, figure out what our, our sort of columns are going to look like. And uh, the suggestion uh, that I like is that we sort of think along different dimensions. So we don't, we, this is a security course. It's a security tool. So obviously, we're going to think about how the security compares. But security trades off with other things. Um, so I'm roughly going to call them usability. And uh, I'll call it deployability, meaning you know, how much does it cost? Is it backwards compatible? That kind of stuff. You have to change how every computer on the face of the planet works, right? That's not going to be a deployable option, uh, that kind of thing. OK. Uh, someone tell me, besides password, I told you what I like. Someone tell me something different. What, what's something that you like out of this list? If you had to choose some alternative to password, what do you like and why? Just shut it out. OK, so I heard a bunch of things at once. Biometrics. OK, biometrics. Why do we like biometrics? User-friendly. User -friendly. OK, so there's some usability benefits to it. Specifically what? what? Let's, so the point of this criteria is, too, that we have to be really, really specific. So, OK, so there's some sort of speed. Um, now, is that the speed that it takes the system to recognize it? Or is it like the speed to enter it? OK. OK, so, so it's easier to enter somehow, OK? So it has nothing to do with, well, anyways, I'll, I'll, have, I'll get to what it has nothing to do with. OK, um, so this is good. So we'll file this under usability. So I'm going to just abbreviate them. So we'll call this U1 for usability criteria 1. Uh, by the way, some people are looking at notes from last year. Don't do that, because it's more fun if you actually think about it. Um, and so. Uh, the term that's used in a paper that I'll show you later that actually defined this, I'm going to try and follow the paper as close as possible, even though it's not strictly necessary. They use a term, they call it physically effortless. Okay. Uh, so physically effortless means I didn't have to put a lot of physical effort into logging it. Okay. Now, note that they could have said requires physical effort. Okay. And you can still rank them. But in this case, Passwords require physical effort, so they would get the full dot, and biometrics would get a half dot, and a half dot's good, that's what you want. But what I'm saying is this chart's going to be a lot easier to read if you know that the full dot is always the good thing, the thing that you want. Okay? So you could phrase this as requires physical effort, but we're going to play grammatical tricks so that we can always phrase it as in a positive way. So you want this property. It's not, it's not a property that you don't want. It's a property that you do want. So we'll invert requires physical effort to say it's physically effortless. Doesn't require physical effort. OK? Um, and then we can think about uh, what does our ranking look like? Uh, so we have three levels. And you don't always have to have three levels. You could have more. You could have less. Maybe for some of them, you realize it's really black and white. Uh, so we're just going to have uh, an empty cell or a full dot. Uh, there's different ways of doing it. So what I would say uh, for something that requires physical effort, like a password to me requires physical effort. It should not get any uh, grades on this. And that's because I have to type it in. Okay, So anything I have to type is going to do bad. Then I can go up to my list and say, OK, so passwords I'm going to type. Biometrics, I won't have to type. We'll think about what that means. Hardware token, I'm going to type in the number. Uh, Google two-factor, I have to sort of copy and paste from the, mess from the instant message. I still have to type a password in regardless of what the two-factor is. Password managers, I don't have to type. Um, but I do have to type the password in once, right? So is that physically effort or not? OK, well, that, so this is where you might be like, well, that's kind of like a halfway point. Right? Like, like, yeah, you do have to do this bad thing, but you only have to do it once. Yep. OK? So we could be like, OK, you have to always type it, and then you just type it once. Um, 
The other thing I'm, I want to get to before I, I just phrase that out. Uh, so client certificates, you'll just click on something, single sign-on similarly to password managers. You might have to put your Facebook password in, but just once, once you're logged into Facebook, everything else will work. Graphical passwords, you're still making an effort. It's just a draw as opposed to a type. Is drawing better than typing? Maybe it's a little faster, but then you could also swipe type and that would be similar too. So anyway, so you might think of the middle ground as like you could have type, draw, draw is kind of a middle down and then not do anything or just click, right? Or you might say type in drawing is, is this is how I'm going to do it. So if you have to type and draw every login, I'm going to say that's bad. Uh, if you have to type and draw once, or once per session or, or something like that, then I'll be like, that's kind of like a half mark. And then here it's sort of like you never uh, type or draw. Okay, now there's different ways of doing this. This is an art, it's not a science. I'm not saying that this is the only way that you can evaluate this exact property. This is the only property that you can come up with. Um, at the end of the day, you hope that the whole thing comes together and tells you a good story, okay? Uh, if something's bad on usability, uh, it should be, you know, not getting full dots all over the place. Exactly how you phrase them and things like that, uh, that's sort of, you know, having done this in an academic setting with other people, you spend a lot of time arguing about it. Um, and it doesn't make a big difference at the end of the day, but uh, you do want to think through uh, exactly what you're doing. Okay, so physically effortless, that's good. Uh, so biometrics uh, are great. Uh, we can think about what our chart, actually I'll, I'll do the chart later. Let's just grab our, our columns first. Um, now for me, the fingerprint, when you said the fingerprint usability was good, I was thinking of actually something different. Is there something else that's good in terms of usability of a biometric as opposed to say a password? Okay, there's nothing to memorize, right? <laughs> Uh, if you have passwords, you have to remember them, right? And that takes some cognitive ability. You have to recall the password. Uh, you might forget the password, that kind of thing. Biometrics, it's always there, right? Now, biometrics has its own kind of bad things, right? Like sometimes it doesn't work, yeah. right? Like for whatever reason, you get cut on your finger, or you have a scarf on and you're using Face ID or whatever the case may be. Um, and so we can penalize that as well. But that's a separate category. So we, we want to think about this. So a uh, second usability factor, I would say, is nothing to, to memorize. I guess they, they call it um, memory-wise effortless. So it's sort of the same. Okay, so once again, we're phrasing it possibly. We could say it requires memorization, but we're saying nothing to memorize because we want this property. Um, so nothing to memorize, a full dot means literally that. Okay, so I don't have to remember anything. Uh, so there's nothing to memorize. At the other extreme, you might think of passwords. And so if you follow the security advice of people, they'll say, you know, memorize all your passwords, right? So if you have, 100 passwords, you're memorizing 100 things. They're all different, right? Everyone uses a different password for every site. You only memorize it. Um, so we can think of uh, the extreme case being n passwords for, I'll say x. It's usually a better variable. So x passwords for x websites. There's, you use passwords, obviously, for things other than websites, but we'll just think about websites. Okay, and then we might think of the middle ground. Um, so if we do a sanity check, we can kind of go through and be like, okay, so passwords I have, and I have to remember X passwords. Biometrics, I don't have to remember any, that's zero. Here, I'm gonna have to remember X because I'm still gonna have a password for every site. I'm just gonna have some extra stuff. Same with two-factor. Oh, password managers, how many passwords do I have to remember? One. 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 Okay, is one zero or is it N, or is it X, sorry. It's middle ground, so that, that's a good candidate. Um, so for a middle, uh, you might say uh, one password for X sites. Okay. 
Yeah. Like, uh, could be your RSA. Yeah. You have to divide. You don't need to memorize anything, right? You just have to see the chip and then type the thing. Right. So let me um, uh, let me spend a few minutes on this. Uh, okay. I'm gonna save some space for the chart, and then let me make kind of like a notes section. Uh, so RSA is a little confusing. Let me actually just go through the whole protocol for people who don't know what it what it looks like. Um, so here's Alice. And here's a service that Alice wants to log into. OK, so to answer your question directly, no, you still have a password for every site. So this is going to be an additional factor on top of your password. Okay, so what you're going to do is Alice is going to have um, a username. She'll have a password. So we can call this U. And we can call this P. And in addition, she's going to have this like token thing. It might be on her phone now, but it, it usually it used to classically be like something that would be on your keychain. Does anyone have an RSA token on them that can hold it up? Just show and tell. Okay, while you dig that out, I'll, I'll just do a little drawing. Okay, so people on the video can't see it, but uh, this is what it looks like. I won't push the button. Uh, but yeah, it's just a fob. It has an LED screen. Uh, it has a button, so if you push it, uh, then a number will appear, and then you can Okay, so what happens is Alice says, hey, I want to log into the service. And so the service says, great, uh, I'm going to need two things from you. Well, I'll need your username. I'll need your password. And I also want to know the token or the number uh, that's on the screen at this particular time. So we'll call it T for token. Okay, your password will never change. Or you could change whenever you change your password. So once every, everyone changes their password once a month, right? Um, so that's also like security advice that's like, doesn't actually provide a lot of benefit. Um, uh, so this is pretty, this is sort of static. And this is dynamic. So every time she logs in, she'll have a different value here. Okay, so she has this T value. So she sends UPT across to the service. Okay, now what the service does is either they, they might manage it in house, but more typically uh, they'll go over to a company like RSA that's actually giving the tokens. And they'll say, okay, I just got a login request from this user, and they're saying that this is what's on their token at this particular time. Okay, and so what RSA is going to do is they're going to have a list of um, basically when you register it, you're going to say, okay, here's this user, here's the ID for their token. So it's kind of like every token has like kind of a serial number. And then they're going to have some way of generating what is the number that appears on that token at a given time, okay? Now the way it does not work, you might think it works, is that RSA is sending that number to this token, okay? That's not happening. This, these tokens are dumb. They don't have any internet connectivity. They're not a wireless device or anything like that, okay? So how is it that this server knows, say this thing's updating every five seconds, how is it that this server knows what's on this token at any given time if they're not actually Okay, so they're in sync. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to cycle through a bunch of random numbers in a certain sequence, and they're just going to be synchronized in terms of time. How do you generate, how do you churn through a number, a bunch of numbers in sequence? To the random generator. Okay, all right, so some of you have taken 6110. If you have not, this detail doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, but if you've taken 6110, which is a cryptography course, uh, you'll have encountered pseudo random number generators. So that's what it is. So RSA has a pseudo random number generator. What do you need to put inside a pseudo random number generator? It's, it's called a seed typically. Um, so they'll just have a seed sitting here. Okay. And your token has a physical in its circuit also has the same pseudo random number generator and that seed is hard baked into this token, okay? So at one time, RSA held both the token and the database 
they set them up, synchronized them, and then they sent the token off to the company. The company gave it out to Alice, okay? Um, so anyway, so then what RSA will do is they'll run PRG on seed up to the current time. They'll check whether it matches this. They do allow for some slippage because they realize that the timing isn't always perfect. And so if the number doesn't match what it should, they'll be like, okay, well, does it match the previous 100 values or the next 100 values? And then they'll kind of resynchronize their clocks uh, in order to, to, to do it. But with this, they have sufficient information to make a decision, okay? So they can send back to the server either, yes, this is what should be on this user's token, or uh, no, this is not what should be on this server's token. This user's token, pardon me. Okay, so they send this back, okay? Then the service, if they get a positive response from RSA, then they'll check the password. So the service has a database too, where it has usernames and hopefully hashes of passwords, not actual passwords. Um, and so it will go and it will say, okay, uh, is P the right password for this user? And then their password log will get uh, either a yes or a no. Okay, and then they'll send back a decision to the user, which will also be either yes. So if, they, if it's a yes on both fronts, uh, then they get to log in. And if, it's a, if either of them return false, then, then they'll say false. Okay, generally they won't tell you which failed, they'll just say one of them failed. Okay, it doesn't always look like this. Sometimes you put the token in first and then on another screen you look at the password or sometimes you'll put the password. If the password doesn't match, they don't bother talking to RSA. Uh, so, so there's different considerations there, but those are small, minor details. What would happen if this leaked, by the way? This file? We could use the, uh, we have to have the timestamp. And yeah. We might be able to. Okay, well, you, you could, presuming that the timestamp stuff is here as well. Okay. If this leaked, you basically could predict what's on everyone's token. Mm -hmm. Okay? Turns out, it did leak once. Uh, so there was a big hack of RSA, um, and someone was able to break in and steal effectively this list that had all the seeds for all of the tokens. And so everyone that had a token, um, well, so what happens then? Does that mean I can log in as you? So no, so I still need the password. So that's okay, right? Uh, but all it did is it took two-factor authentication and reduced it to one-factor authentication. So now you, the security that you have is a username and a password. Okay, but it got rid of that second factor. There was no additional security on top of the account. Okay, how did they hack RSA? That must have been pretty hard. RSA is a huge security company. Fishing? Yeah, so they sent a, an email to the HR department and they said, here's this file that you've been looking for. Uh, the person downloaded it. It had some malware in it. And anyways, well, actually, I'll go through detail because it's actually a really interesting uh, case. So when we talk about social engineering, uh, we'll talk about it. But yeah, that's how hacks work today, okay? That's how the biggest security company got hacked. It wasn't people, you know, breaking in, penetrating the network. Uh, it was a social, uh, what we call spear phishing. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll do two classes on social engineering because it's, it's a really uh, kind of good topic. Anyways, uh, back to passwords. That's the story there. So you still have passwords uh, for every site. You just have this additional token. Okay, give me some other criteria. I'm realizing now that I should have left more space for this. But. Okay, so we have some good uh, kind of usability stuff. Um, what about security? Um, okay, so there's something about, uh, if we want to stick with the RSA thing, what is it that, is an RSA token more secure than just a password? Probably, right? I mean, it's no worse, definitely, right? At, at best, it, it adds nothing to your security. Uh, now you have to carry something around, okay? So it's a little worse for usability. We can actually, I'll, I'll add that in as usability. It's one that we had last time, so nothing to carry. Yeah. 
Uh, like, can you give an example? Yeah, so you have to spend some time thinking about what do the rows mean? What does it mean to be an alternative? What I would suggest is, is for a decision maker, like I'm deciding I have a web server and people are going to log in. I do choose between whether I just have you do a simple password or I have you do two-factor authentication. So for me, even though there is some overlap in those technologies, it is a, de a decision that I'm making. So you can think of the rows as uh, you would decide to do one of these things. And so if you decide just to do passwords, that's different than deciding to do an RSA token. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so nothing to carry. So an RSA token would do bad. Um, so you have like some something new to carry. A password, you're not carrying around anything, so that's good. The middle ground, some people argue, is sometimes there's things that you're carrying around with you anyways. So like an RSA token, that's kind of like a new thing. But let's say you're doing Google two-factor authentication. They're basically the exact same technology, but one's on your phone and you're carrying your phone anyway. Um, so that's that's a little bit better than than introducing something new. So you might phrase the, the middle ground as something to carry that you're already carrying. That is common. OK, so let's go back to security. OK, so why RSA token probably better than a normal password in terms of security? Why? OK, so it's random. Why is random good? Hard to guess. Hard to guess. OK, so one thing I can do is if I don't know your password, there's one attack I can always do, and it's always try every password. And it will work. Eventually, I'll get in. OK, uh, so we call this like an exhaustive search. Um, property. Uh, so I'll, I'll phrase it as resilient to guessing. And I'm actually going to split it into two. Okay, so let's go back to this chart. So let's think about what's going on here. Um, Forget about the two-factor authentication. So let's just sort of simplify this. So um, we'll call it simple login. So this is RSA. Okay, so in a simple login, you just have a username password. So Alice will send username password over to the service. Uh, the service will respond with either yes, this password's good, or no, this password's not good. And the way it makes a decision is it's going to refer to some file, and the file will have every user's username, and then they'll have their password. And ideally, what they're going to do is they're going to obfuscate the password somehow. So if you just look at this file, you don't know what the password is. But if you have a guess as to what the password is, you can test whether that guess is correct or not. Okay. So one way of doing it, once again, you'll have to take 6110 to understand hash functions. But if you hash a password, when I look at that, I can't figure out what the password is. A hash is a one-way function. But if I think I know what your password is, I can hash my guess, and then I can see whether it matches that password, okay? If it matches that password, then I've guessed your password, okay? So hashes don't stop guessing attacks, um, but they actually force them. So, so instead of just having the password sitting there in clear text, you have to guess, okay? Now, there's two ways in this scenario I can guess. One way is I can send username one to the server and it will say no, and they'll say username two, username three, username four, okay? What happens after I guess 10 times? probably is going to lock me out or something like that, okay? And it's going to be slow, right? Uh, you know, I have to send a, a packet every single time I want to guess, okay? So what we do is if you want to do a guessing through like kind of a web interface, you're not guessing as fast as you can. You're sort of subject to what that web interface is allowing. 
Uh, it's going to be slow because it's going over a network, that kind of thing. So when that kind of slows you down, okay? Now slowing you down is good because what that means is I can guess less passwords, okay? I have less at the end, okay? So if your password's weak, it's going to take me longer to find it uh, as opposed to if I'm not slowed down, okay? So slowing down is in your favor. You want, uh, it would be great if all password guessing had to happen through a web interface um, uh, because then you would, you would get slowed down. So that idea of slowing down we call throttling. Um, so you can have uh, throttled guessing. Okay. The alternative is, let's say I get my hands on this file. Someone breaks into it, they put it on uh, pastebin or something like that. So now I have this hash. Then what I can do is I still have to guess your password, but nothing is slowing me down, right? Just as fast as I can hash, right? So I'll take the top million most common passwords. You can get those lists very easily. I'll run them through the hash function and you know I can do millions of them you know, in a second, right? Uh, and so you can get tools like Johnny the Ripper and things like that, uh, that will, will help you uh, do that, okay? And then it will try different combinations and it will replace the letter capital E with the number three because it kind of looks like a capital letter, but some people do that or it will try different combinations of words and you know, whatever someone has ever thought of was, is a good idea for a password, uh, it, will, it will figure it out. And even worse is if it just uses a hash function then people have already probably hashed every single password that's common with that hash function. Uh, so you can just get a list of it already hashed. You don't have to even do it yourself. That's called a rainbow table. So that's another way. There's, there's ways of adding salt and, and some things that you can do to slow it down. Take 6110 and, and you'll, we can talk about it in that context. But the point is you can do it a lot faster when you're not relying on a website uh, to tell you whether your guess is right or wrong. You're just relying on your computer. Uh, to do it, your supercomputer or your cluster of computers or whatever the case may be, okay? So we call this unthrottled guessing. Okay, so let's say that we want you to be resilient to guessing. Um, what we need to say is, we have to say something about how good your password is. Okay, so some passwords are resilient to guessing and some of them are not, right? Uh, if you choose the password dog, it's not going to be resilient to guessing, okay? If you have some 64 character alphanumerical selected completely random, that is going to be resilient to guessing, okay? So where's the line? Where, when do we cross from good password to bad password, okay? And can we actually say something about the quality of passwords? Like, let's say I want to measure it. You know, how would I measure the quality of a password? Can I look at it and say, oh, that's, that's a 10 and that's a 100? Okay, so there is a concept. Okay, okay, so there's a few things we can do. First off is we can look at, yeah, like what character sets it's drawing from. Um, that actually doesn't tell you anything unless if it's randomly selected. Okay, if it's randomly selected, then the more characters that you select from, it's better. Even if you have alphanumerical, capital, lowercase, numbers, special symbols, you can still have easy to guess passwords uh, in that sense, okay? So what we have is there's actually a mathematical, once again, it's, it's more of a 6110 topic, but there is a mathematical definition of unpredictability. Okay, how unpredictable is something? So a password that I can guess is predictable. And if it's unpredictable, we call that entropy. Okay, and you can put a number on it, literally. You can say that that's, that's 64, or that's 10, or that's 20, okay? Uh, the unit is called bits. Uh, and so if something is, say, has 64 bits of entropy, what we say is it's as random as flipping a coin 64 times. So if you flip a coin 64 times, you'll get a heads tails with 50% probability 64 times. That's some pool of randomness. And so we're saying your password is as, as random as that, okay? Um, so anyways, entropy not super important, but the point is that uh, if we have throttling, we can tolerate lower entropy. We don't need high entropy or good quality passwords because the web interface is going to slow you down. But if we want to be resilient to throttled guess, unthrottled guessing, where you can go as fast as your cluster of computers, then we're going to need even higher entropy, 
okay? Now, where is that line? How many bits are enough? We don't really know, okay? But the numbers that, that, that uh, the, the paper that I'm citing sort of put on it is, um, first off, they don't really consider a middle ground. They just consider this as either it's sufficient or not. And so in the throttled world where a web interface is slowing you down, they still want to see 64 bits. Okay, so if you don't have 64 bits, if you're less, then you're still going to be resilient. Even in a throttle environment, I'll still have a chance at guessing your password. Uh, if I have more than 64, then the web interface is going to slow me down. But if I get rid of the web interface, then I can guess a lot quicker and 64 is not going to be enough. Okay, I'm going to need something that's higher. Um, so NIST has a standard that says you need 112 bits. And this is like overly conservative, but if you have this number of entropy, then it's, it's unguessable. Even if you run a computer for the lifetime of the universe, uh, you're never going to uh, guess something that's truly random in 112 bits with any sense of, except for with negligible probability. Okay, uh, what does this mean? I'll interpret it for you. Okay, so one thing we'll have to do is when we put these dots in is we're gonna have to figure out what is a password, what is, uh, what's a fingerprint, like how much entropy does that have, um, how much does a key have, that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll guide you through that. But now we at least have a template for kind of thinking about uh, the security property. Okay, uh, what are some other things? Let's, uh, let's focus on Android swipe patterns, okay? Uh, so let's say you have a phone and you have a choice between either putting in a normal password up here or you have a choice of doing a swipe pattern. Maybe the swipe pattern is better usability. Maybe it's lower entropy, right? So we've already captured those two. Is there any other consideration that you might have? Does anyone have an opinion on, or are they both the same? Is there anyone who would who would choose the swipe pattern? Why? Easy, 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 fast. easy, fast. Yeah. What if I was looking over your shoulder? Do you think it would be easier for me to figure out what your swipe pattern is or to see you type in a password? OK, so maybe a swipe pattern is actually a little easier. Um, in both cases, though, I could look over your shoulder and see what you're typing in. If you put a fingerprint, can I do that? What if you have a password manager and I watch you, you know, click on a login, it's yellow, and you say, yeah, put in password, and then your password appears with the asterisk. Can I see you actually type your password in? No. No, because no, you don't type your password in, right? Um, so, so shoulder surfing uh, is something that we might consider. So this could be another security property. So say it's resilient to observation. So here we might say you type or draw something. Here we can say there's nothing to, nothing entered. Maybe there's a middle ground, not sure what it is. Anyone have a good middle ground? Okay, what about your password? Um, so I can't see you type your password in, right? Uh, there's, there's nothing to see. Is that true? Is there nothing to see with your password? Uh, like, well, I can't see you type it in, right? So I, you know, I'm going to put my finger on it. So there's nothing to see here. What if I held up my thumb? Is there something to see? Well, you can't see it from there, but if you had a high definition camera, could you see something? Yeah. Probably. So it actually happened. So there were some politicians that showed their fingers on high definition television and someone was able to take their password and then create a rubber thumb uh, with the password uh, printed on it. And then they were able to unlock an iPhone uh, with it. Not that person's actual iPhone. I think it was uh, the president of Germany or something. I forget the exact details. But anyways, uh, so that's an example actually of theft. Right, so with a fingerprint, I could actually kind of steal your fingerprint, okay? And there's other things I could steal here too, right? Um, you know, you could think about it if I steal your token or your phone, 
where we're eventually going is you still have the password, so that's not going to be sufficient. But in a client certificate, that's the only thing you have. It's sitting on your computer. If I can steal your computer, then I can log in uh, to all of your websites. Um, so we could think about resilient to theft, resilience to theft. So I'll just keep this binary and say, uh, you know, stealing is sufficient. Stealing something sufficient to log in. And same thing, insufficient. Sorry, the, yeah, yeah, we'll just leave that. Um, I'll just drop it. Okay, what about deployability? So we don't have any deployability things. What are some things that you might consider here? So let's say you're trying to decide between a password and uh, an RSA token. Yeah, okay, so for fingerprints, we're gonna need a fingerprint reader. Why is that bad? Okay, so cost is, is basically, it boils down to cost. Yeah. yeah, there's maintenance, and so we can maybe come up with a couple different criteria. Uh, let's do cost, it's the most obvious. Um, so uh, we wanna phrase it posi positively, so we'll say it's inexpensive, or we can say it has negligible cost. So here we can say it, it sort of works with existing equipment. So there's nothing new to buy. Uh, here there's something, you have to buy something new. And you can think of different middle grounds. So you could just do it based on cost. You could say it's under 100 bucks. Uh, that's it. Still costs something. So that's sort of a middle ground. But if it's over 100 dollars, that's crazy. Um, you might also think about how much is it per user or per login. So an RSA token, if you're a company and you have 200 employees, you need 200 tokens. But if you're doing fingerprints, you only need one fingerprint reader. So yeah, your fingerprint reader is more expensive, but you only need one of them. Uh, so you might think of marginal costs versus fixed or overhead costs. Um, so anyway, there's different ways of doing it. Let's just do the, I did it last year as fixed uh, versus overhead. So um, buy new equipment, uh, we'll say per user cost. And here we'll say buy new equipment, uh, just sort of a one-time cost. Okay, so there's lots more, uh, but this is a good, good enough set that you can definitely get the idea of it. So let's just complete it, and we'll actually do our, our, our little chart. All right, so we have passwords. Biometrics, RSA. I'll just, I'll try and write them small. two-factor authentication, manager certs, single sign-on, and if I'm not mistaken, graphical. Okay, so here's our eight rows in this table. <coughs> 
And then for columns, we have three usability properties. We have four security properties and one deployability property. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one. Okay, so that's, we can hopefully do this fairly quickly. All right, so the first property we have, yeah, question. Yeah, 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 so, so there are, um, so you want a new column, right, to capture that? Is it which, sorry? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so you can introduce new columns to capture that, right? Yeah, so, so anyways, these columns aren't meant to be complete. Uh, so there might be columns that we missed uh, as a result. Okay. Okay, so U1 is uh, physically effortless. Um, so do we have to type something once all the time, uh, none of the time? So passwords, we have to always type it. Biometrics, uh, we don't have to ever type. So we'll give it a full dot. RSA, we still have to type every time. Two-factor, we have to type every time. Password manager, we just type once. Certificates, you're going to click. Uh, single sign-on, you might have to type in your master password for Facebook or whatever, but not for every site. And graphical, you're still doing it every time. You're just drawing, you're not typing. Okay, so because, first off, this, this was a fairly effortless filling this in. A lot of that comes because we made really crisp definitions. So they're, they should be like fairly obvious what they are. In a paper, if you were doing this, you do have to still justify why, but you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, justifying it if your definitions are really, really crisp. Nothing to memorize. Okay, so X passwords, one passwords, or zero passwords. With just passwords, we have X passwords, so that's the worst. Biometrics, we have no passwords, so that's great. RSA, we still have X passwords. Two-factor, we still have X passwords. A password manager, we memorize one password. Uh, certificates, we have no passwords. Single sign-on, uh, we have to memorize one. And then graphical, we don't. Okay, now notice something curious. What's curious about this? It looks the same, right? So why is it the same? Both of them come down to how many passwords do you have, right? So one is, it's, this one's about whether you have to type it in, and this is whether you have to memorize it, okay? But if you have to memorize it and you have to type it in, it ends up being the same thing, okay? So this is where you might look at it and you might say, well, we should actually just collapse those into a single column, okay? So that's a decision uh, that you can make. Or you might say, hey, they are actually kind of separate things, did I miss? Maybe there's maybe there's something where these are different, right? Like there's something where you type them in but you don't memorize them, right? Uh, or maybe I need to define it a little different. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, they should be pulled out here. Okay. Anyways, we'll move on. Uh, so U three, uh, nothing to carry. Um, okay, so passwords, we have nothing to carry, so that's great. That's actually why they sort of caught on. Biometrics, I'm carrying my fingerprints with me anyway. That's close enough to saying nothing to carry, so I'll uh, give it the full dot. RSA, I do have something new to carry, okay, so it's not going to get anything. Uh, Two-factor authentication, I have to carry my phone. I'm kind of carrying it with me anyways. That's sort of maybe in the middle ground. Uh, password manager, you can also, you can think of it different ways, but you do have to actually kind of carry your password manager around. You can't sit down at a brand new computer uh, without it. You can now with the cloud. Um, so this is also where there might be like different ways of evaluating the password manager. So there's one with cloud sync. And so cloud sync would get you the dot here, but you might lose a dot somewhere else on security uh, because now I have more opportunity to, or on privacy or something like that. And there's a lot of things that we miss. So another thing you need to do 
is you really need to clarify how these things work. It's not obvious. Like, does a password manager even have a master password? Some of them do, some of them don't, and that's going to also change. Like here, we're assuming that there's one master password. Okay. So anyways, let's lock this in as not cloud-based. Uh, so there is something to carry, but it's something I'm carrying around anyway, so I'll, I'll do it like this. Certificates, you do have to carry it. It's on your computer, though, so it's kind of like your password manager. Um, single sign-on, there's nothing to carry. Uh, and graphical, there's nothing to carry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's turn to security. Uh, so now we have to figure out, okay, what's the entropy of all of these things? Okay, uh, is it sort of, is it bad? Uh, and so the end result here is either, notice that if you get a full dot here, you have to get a full dot here, because if you have more than 112, you also have more than 64, okay? So uh, if we look at these two properties sort of side by side, you could get none, uh, you could get a full dot here, but not here, or you can get a full dot here. So there's actually only three combinations. Uh, the thing that's impossible is a full dot here and an empty dot here. Um, okay. How random is a password? Okay, so it depends on the password. Um, let's skip it. Let's come back to that. Uh, what about biometrics? Uh, what about a fingerprint? Is that, uh, you know, how much entropy does a fingerprint have? Okay, so it depends on the biometric itself. Uh, so you can do some analysis of it and some of its guesswork and things like that. Uh, we think that they're probably actually around that 64-bit thing. So they're not super strong. They're kind of sufficiently, sometimes they might be lower bounded by like 40 bits or something like that, but they're kind of in that middle ground. So that's why I kind of wanted to highlight the difference or the authors of the paper wanted to highlight the difference between throttled and unthrottled. So fingerprints are the one where we might give it the full dot if you're using a web interface, but if I have just a hash of your fingerprint, I can probably guess it, okay? Uh, so sorry, this should just be empty. We'll come back to this. Okay, RSA two-factor authentication. The second factor is completely random. It's chosen at random. If it's long enough, it can have 112 bits. Okay, it has to be fairly long, but it's not so long that you can't type it in. Plus, you have your password on top of it. Um, so this uh, should get the full dot on both. Password managers, uh, once again, you have to make some assumptions about how they're going to be used. Uh, I'm going to assume that because you only have to memorize one password, you're going to pick a pretty strong password as your master password. Uh, and then for all the site by site passwords, it's choosing it for you and they choose them fairly random. Like I use Safaris all the time and it's, uh, it's random. It's way more than 64 bits. It's probably over the 112 bits. You have to sit down and calculate it. Okay, certificates are definitely, they're fully random. Okay, uh, single sign-on. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, we'll make the same assumption as your password manager. So you have a sufficiently strong uh, one password that you're wrapping your account with. And then in order for it to authenticate you to all the sites, it's using cookies. Uh, we haven't talked about how cookies work, but they basically have a, like a key or a token, a session ID value in it that is usually sufficiently random. It can be a, a, a big, long random string. So that's fine. Uh, graphical passwords uh, tend to be low entropy. Uh, they're probably as bad as passwords. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to how random they are. Uh, so I want to spend a little time on just how random passwords are. Uh, I'm going to do a little diversion. So that's why I'm just going to hold on to that for a second. Um, OK, next one, resilient observation. Um, OK, password, I can see you type it in. So I'm not going to give the mark. Biometrics, I can't see it. So that's good. Uh, RSA, I can see you type it in. I can see you type in both of them. Two-factor, it uh, depends how it works. But assuming that you're like kind of typing, I can at least I can sh shoulder surf and see the text message that you get. Plus, I can see you type your password in. So let's not give it the mark. Uh, password manager, I can't see. Uh, if I, I can see you type your master password in, but I can't see you 
uh, when you're on a site by site basis, uh, it's going to autofill it, uh, so I won't see it. Certificates, same thing, it will autofill. Single sign on, same thing, it will autofill. Uh, graphical passwords, uh, I can see. Maybe even easier to see <laughs> than a password. Um, resilient to physical theft, okay? Can't steal your password physically, right? I can steal it like I can shoulder surf it, but there's nothing physical to steal. Biometrics there is, I can steal an image of whatever it is that you're using as your biometric. RSA, I can steal your token, but not your password. But if I just steal your token, that's not sufficient. Okay, it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. So we won't ding either of these. Similar that I can change your, choose your phone. Uh, password manager, there's nothing to steal. I can steal the manager itself, but if it's wrapped in a master password, I don't know your master password. Um, and I can't physically steal it. Uh, certificates I can steal, so there's oh. something that's sitting on it. They might be password wrapped too, but anyways, my mental model of certificates, just to make it a little different than managers, is that it's a file, it's sitting on your computer, uh, and so if I can steal your computer, I can steal your file. Uh, single sign-on, there's nothing to steal. Sorry? Graphical password, same thing. Yeah? Um, I think single sign-on tokens can be stolen because that happened in November with Facebook, I guess. Right, right, right. Okay, so here we, uh, so we did define S4 as physical theft, right? So uh, that I wouldn't consider a physical theft, but you are right, they can be stolen. So uh, it's similar to stealing your password from your password manager, it's data. So I'm doing a, a data style theft. And so that's what we need. We need another column to capture that idea of whether we can steal uh, things. So I'll show you the full paper. The full paper has like 30 columns, uh, but one of them will, will deal with that exact attack. Yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah. Sometimes I forget the difference between a full and a half. Okay, let's do deployability quick and then we'll uh, circle back to the others. Uh, so do we have to buy anything? So passwords, we don't have to buy anything, so that's good. Biometrics, we have to buy one thing. RSA tokens, we have to buy everything. Uh, Two-factor depends, uh, like, Maybe you already have your phone anyways. Um, let's kind of put in, a, a, this breaks the semantics of what a half dot means, but I, I don't want to give it a full or an empty. I'll just, I'll just pencil in that way. Uh, managers are free. Certificates are free. I mean, you might have to pay to get them certified. That's a, a whole separate story that we'll spend a lot of time talking about. Um, single sign on is effectively free and graphical passwords are free. Okay. So are these thoughts perfect? Maybe not. Uh, if you do this in assignment, you should spend more than the amount of time I just spent on uh, doing it. Uh, but anyways, this gives you an idea of what it is, okay? If we look at this, I'll, when we come back from the break, I'll fill in the two question marks. If we look at it, what's the best? So you can't really tell. I mean, it depends, once again, it depends on what you care about. So biometrics does look good. It has a lot of full dots, but if you care about costs, if that's your most important thing, then it's not good, right? And so this chart isn't meant, you're not supposed to have a totals at here and say, you know, you get two points for every full dot and one point for every half dot and we're going to add them up. This is meant to just neutrally say, okay, there's all these trade-offs uh, that exist and this is going to help you sort through uh, what those trade-offs are, okay? Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about the guessability of passwords. Okay. All right, so first off, someone during the break pointed out that I actually inverted this column. So I, where it should have been a full dot, it, I wrote an empty dot and vice versa. So I fixed S4. Uh, so hopefully this is right. Um, so I want to do two things. So the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about how weak are passwords. And so my assertion to you is that a human chosen password is very weak. Uh, it's probably not even in the territory of 64 bits, okay? Uh, if it's a system chosen password, that's different. We saw some examples like in the password manager, um, but a human uh, chosen password. Uh, so we'll say password guessability. So system chosen, the, the 
assumption is that it's random. Uh, and so this will be strong, provided it's long enough. And even if it's not that long, like say, um, well, anyways, you can work out how many you need, say, to get 40 bits or 64 bits of entropy. How many characters would you need if you have 64 bits per character? Because uh, you have capital, lowercase, maybe a couple special symbols and, and some numbers. Um, okay, so so anyway, so I'm going to motivate this. I want to show you what is my absolute favorite picture in all of computer science. Uh, before I show you that, though, uh, I, I'll show you what this chart would look like in a professional kind of paper. So. Uh, this was just a, a sort of warm-up. We did it in class off the top of our heads. It looks pretty good. On the far extreme, if you wanted to, say, get this published at a top security conference, uh, you might do it like this. Uh, so there's a, actually an entire paper that does this. So I'll just uh, put the citation into the notes here. Whoops. Uh, so you can look up this paper. I think it's also linked to uh, from the course website, if I'm not mistaken. OK, so if we go to the actual chart itself, they do a little better job than us. So this is their chart. Um, so first off, you can see they do actually evaluate a lot of different things. Uh, so sometimes they look at this. We looked at one thing, for example, password manager. Uh, we looked at one kind of configuration. They might look at two configurations. OK, so like different actual systems. Uh, there's other things that, that we didn't talk about. Like you can have paper-based like passwords where you have this like grid and you read your paper out. Um, for graphical passwords, they looked at a couple different types. For federated, they said, okay, what, what's the difference between Facebook and, say, Microsoft, which passwords not really used much anymore, but, like, there might be specific differences between them. So, anyways, and then instead of just RSA, they looked at a bunch of things that are kind of like RSA, like YubiKey and IronKey and a couple of different things uh, there. Same with Google Two-Step. Uh, there's other uh, kind of competitors. And they all do things, like, slightly differently, okay? Uh, so it's sort of a more thorough look. Uh, then you can see... Uh, they do have usability, deployability, and security, uh, but they have lots of different ones. So we look at some of them. So we talked about Memorize, Effortless. Uh, they have an idea of how scalable is it for users. Uh, we talked about nothing to carry physically effortless. Is it easy to learn? Uh, is it efficient to use? Uh, what about errors, right? If if you're, say it's a, an RSA token, how easy is it to type a number in wrong, right? And then you're going to make an error. Um, so how frequent are the errors? What happens if you lose your device, you lose your password, whatever it is? Can you recover it? Right? If you lose a finger, you're kind of out of luck. Um, deployability, uh, so we talked about cost per user is how they phrase it. Uh, they think about compatibility. Do you have to change how all the computers run? Uh, so for example, if you have a third party, you have to introduce that. That has to be a server uh, that you put up. You know, like RSA tokens, they need this other server, that kind of thing. Um, accessibility, is it proprietary, mature, that kind of thing. And then for security, they have resilience to physical observation. So that's kind of like shoulder surfing. Uh, targeted impersonation. So if I know some details about you, can I guess, for example, your password? Uh, throttled guessing, unthrottled guessing we used. Uh, internal observation goes back to the cookies thing. So can your computer steal what it needs to steal? Or if I, yeah, if I have malware on your computer, can I steal it? Uh, if I have a malicious frame that's running parallel to your frame, can I reach in and grab what I need? Uh, so that's, they call it internal observation. Uh, leaks from other verifiers, so if you have third-party verifiers. Uh, phishing, so one of the nice things about uh, uh, password managers is if you go to Google with three O's instead of Google with two O's, your password manager will say, I actually don't have a password stored for that file, for that website, and it won't put your password in. But if you go to it as a human, you might say, oh, that looks like Google. The website looks exactly the same as Google. I don't notice that there's three O's instead of two, and then I might put my password in. Um, so some of them can, can protect you from phishing. Uh, we talked about theft, physical theft. Um, whether we use a third party like Facebook, 
Uh, so that introduces, first off, we have to trust them so that they always make the right decision. Uh, and then there's privacy considerations there as well. Um, explicit consent, you can read the definition on Linkable as well. Um, so anyway, so these are, this is kind of like what a more thorough, polished uh, look would, uh, job would look like. Um, so I'll put this in the notes. It won't be super high resolution. Uh, maybe later I'll, I'll come back and, and copy and paste the higher resolution before I post it to the website. But, so you can look through this at your leisure. They do some color coding and a few other things to make it a little bit more readable. Okay, now if you had to do this on assignment, you're going to do something in between, right? You're not going to go quite this crazy, but you'll do it a little better uh, than we did in class. You can also note if you, if you actually read the paper that the whole paper is actually defining all of these properties. Like that's, there's pages and pages of it, and all it is is really making that chart. Uh, so they go into a lot of detail about exactly what do we mean by uh, each property, what exactly is each of these systems that we're evaluating, and why exactly do we give it a half dot and not a full dot? Uh, you can find an answer to all those questions in a paper like this. Um, so they have very like crisp definitions of, of what everything means and things like that. Okay, uh, the other thing I wanna show you is I wanna try and convince you that human chosen passwords are bad. Um, so there has been some data on human post chosen passwords. Um, this is one paper that looks at it. And so what happens is every now and then, you've probably heard it in the news, uh, you have a website and the website uh, will lose their uh, password database. Uh, and so when they lose their password database, then uh, sometimes they're in clear text. So you just know you have a real life you know, list of passwords uh, that people have chosen. Uh, sometimes they're hashed. So then you have to do an exhaustive search uh, but you can do an exhaustive search with a rainbow table or something like that. Uh, you, could, you could maybe get through a lot of them, so you might be able to recover some of them, uh, not all of them. Um, so this paper looked at, uh, it was trying to answer the question about uh, something simple. So they considered four-digit pins, okay? So four-digit pins are kind of like a subset of, um, of passwords, but it's, it's small enough that you can actually consider every single pin. Okay, so the graphic I'm going to show you actually has every combination of four digits. It's small enough that you can fit it kind of on a screen. Uh, and so that, that makes it interesting to look at. And specifically what they found is there was a website, it was called RockQ. Uh, it leaked all of their passwords. Users were not required to, there was no rules. So if you wanted a password that was a single character, uh, that could be your password. Uh, nothing was enforced. This was like quite a while ago uh, that this website was set up. Uh, but what a lot of users did is they picked four digit passwords, like a pin. Okay. And so what they did is they took, I forget, let's call it like 2 million ish passwords. They looked at the subset of the passwords that were four digits. And then they looked at how, what, what are the four digit pass of the people that are choosing four digit passwords? What are they actually choosing? Okay. And is there any kind of like patterns? Uh, to the kinds of things that they choose. So uh, in order to, to kind of visualize it, uh, they have this really nice chart, which I, as I mentioned, is, is like my favorite thing in all of computer science. And it probably doesn't look like anything to you, but I promise you in 15 minutes, you're gonna love this chart as well. So I'm going to struggle a little to get this bottom full screen. There we go. Just zoom in a bit. OK, so what you're looking at is what's called a heat map. So a heat map is color coordinated. Um, 
the darker a square is, okay, so first off, you're looking at grid. Uh, there's a bunch of little squares that you can see. Each of those squares represents one four-digit password, okay? The darker the square is, the more common it is chosen, and uh, the lighter the square is, the less common it is, okay? Uh, the way you read it is a little, it takes a little bit to get used to, uh, but what they did is they put uh, the first two digits, so you can think of a four-digit pin as X, X, Y, Y, and so let's say, for example, your pin is one, two, three, four. You're going to look for one, two on the x-axis, okay, so that will be here. And then you'll look for three, four on the y-axis, okay? So one, two is here, three, four is here, and then if you intersect those two points, you see a nice little dark square here. And notice that that square is much darker than all the squares that are around it. What does that tell you? That tells you people like one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's a very common password that, that people like. Can anyone else think, can anyone think of another kind of common four digit password that you might choose? Okay, so four digits numbers. Okay, so what about years, right? Years are four digits, right? But I mean, you could have year nine, 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 nine. Right, but okay. So people would probably pick years that are kind of close to them, right? So let's see if we can find years on this. So let's look at like the 1900s to like the kind of 2000s. So uh, let's find the 19 column. So 19 is right here. Um, and so anyway, so let's just pick a random point here. So this point here is 1950. This is 1960. What's this line here? Why is there a streak? Right? What's this streak? This streak is all the passwords that are 19XX. Okay? It's funny because it's a streak. It gets really, really dark. So we go up to 1999 and then we wrap down and we start in the 2000s. Right? So we have 2000. Um, let me uh, put it over here. And then it kind of dies out around 2010. Coincidentally, that's when it was leaked, uh, somewhere around there. So if this data were new, you'd probably see that darker streak uh, continue up. While we're on the topic of dates, uh, what, what's another common four digit? How else could you use four digits to represent a date? Birthday, birthday. Okay, so like your birthday or something like that. So you might do month, year? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay, so for example, my birthday's in January, so that would be 01 something so we can find that so uh here's zero zero here's oh one and you can see it's darker so there is a darker column it's kind of funny because this dark column ends at 31 but then the next one ends at 28 then the next one ends at 31 <laughs> then the next one ends at 30 then 31 then 30 then 31 31 then 30 then 31 then 30 then 31 and then when i get to 13 it just kind of disappears okay so why is that because those are the dates, at least in a Georgian calendar, um, those are the dates of the year. So if you're an alien and you're coming to Earth and you don't know anything about human civilization, all you know is what are the four digit passwords that people choose and which ones are the most common, you can infer what our calendar system looks like, at least in the Western world. Okay, so this is month, month, date, date. Now Americans are weird because they usually will do date, date, month, month. Right? Or maybe we're weird, I can't remember. But what you'll see is if you look down here, you'll see the exact same flip, right? You have the exact same pattern, it's just flipped. And so this is for day, day, month, month. Okay, so like zero, one goes up to 31, then 28, then 30, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this line here is basically uh, something where you have like A, A, B, B, uh, so you have the same number repeated every now and then there's like little dark spots. So this would be something like uh, Actually, we'll talk about that one in a sec. Uh, so this one would be seven 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 uh, So they're they're numbers that have a nice like kind of symmetry uh, to them. I sh sorry I should actually phrase this as a b a b This one is 69 69. I don't no idea what that means. But anyways, it seems very dark people seem to like that number um, here's a fun one. Uh, so this one is 5691. Without Googling it, can anyone tell me what that is? 
I'm predicting zero people in this room can tell me what that is. So let me tell you a story about cell phones before you had an iPhone. So when you had a four-digit phone and you wanted to send a text message, uh, if you wanted to send the letter A, you would press the number one. If you wanted to press, if you wanted to send the number two, you would press one twice, right? Or you would press three times. And so this actually is love type, the word love typed out using old school SMS. Yeah. Uh, so that's there. There's a bunch of like, um, uh, so this was a music site, Rock You. And so there are references to like music albums. 8710 uh, is, a, is an album. There's other mathematical things. So you have one, two, three, four, the flip, you have four, two, three, one. This is an Usher album. Um, anyways, you can spend time looking at this. It's sometimes fun just to pick up black dot and try and figure out what exactly it is. This one I had to Google. I was like, 5691, it's really dark, but I have no idea what it is. And then I Googled it and then it uh, explains it. So you can spend some time looking at this chart. Uh, but anyways, hopefully now you're convinced it actually is an interesting chart. What's the moral of the story? Uh, the moral of the story is you're going to guess a pin. Right? So this happens in real life. Like there was a case in California where uh, someone bombed somewhere, or they threatened to bomb, I can't remember. I think they actually bombed something. And they got a phone. It had a four digit pass, uh, code on it. Um, the problem with it, it was an iPhone. And so the FBI or whoever was investigating, they were worried that if they typed it in wrong 10 times, then it would lock. Okay? Um, so anyways, they were able to circumvent the hardware uh, that protected it. So, th and it turned out there was nothing on the phone, anyways. Um, but anyway, so that that was how they resolved it. But let's say that you couldn't. Like that that hardware is perfect. You have ten shots at a password. Are you going to type one 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 two one 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 three? No, you'll never guess in that order, right? What you're going to do is you're going to probably guess one two three four. Then you're going to try two thousand and one, right? You're going to guess them in frequency of the most commonly picked. Okay, and that's how real guessing works online. So nobody guesses your password as AAA, AAB, AAC, right? No one does that, right? They, they know now there's been enough password leaks that we have a lot of data on what human chosen passwords look like. They do conform to basic rules. Uh, and so password guessing is a lot stronger uh, than you probably think in terms of a mental model of, of what it looks like. Okay, so if you're to guess four digit pins, um, and they do some statistics in the paper. I forget what they are, but you can do a really good job even if you have 10 guesses. Uh, and let's say you have 100 passwords and 10 guesses, you'll break a bunch of them uh, just by guessing the most common uh, passwords because people don't choose things that are randomly. Okay. Um, so, anyways, that's really important when you think about the security of your alternatives. Uh, the best thing that you can do is at least get the security up to where if you have a web interface, you have some sort of throttle guessing, it's going to be secure. Uh, so passwords are absolutely not going to get the dot here and not get the dot here as well. Okay, uh, so that's what I want to say about passwords, questions, or about evaluation frameworks. Okay, you can all do them on an assignment. Yeah, perfect. No one looked very confident. <laughs> okay, uh, so what we did is we, so far, let's just sort of recap where we are. So we talked about something called stride. Uh, we talked about evaluation frameworks. There's one final sort of really high level general uh, approach that I want to talk about. Once again, it's more about brainstorming what security looks like. It's not going to help you uh, find security flaws in something you don't know anything about. Um, but it will help you think about it. Uh, and they're called attack trees.
So as I look at this now, I realize that maybe the order that I present these things is, is slightly out of order. You can think of evaluation frameworks are kind of the most general because you're actually you're looking at more than security and you're looking at more than one solution. Uh, so they're kind of the biggest in terms of their scope. Uh, when you use Stride, you tend to focus in on one thing and you think about, and just security. What are the security attacks on this one thing? Uh, attack trees are a further focusing. So not only are you going to consider only security, not usability or deployability, and you're going to consider one solution, you're actually going to consider one specific attack. Okay, so you're going to say, I have this one attack in mind, and what attack tree, what you're doing is you're basically writing down, what are all the different ways I can think of of accomplishing that goal? So as an adversary, I have some goal, I want to defeat the system in exactly this way, uh, how, could, how do I do it? Right? What are, what are the different ways that I can do it? Now, I mentioned that it's just security, so it's true, but it ends up to be very broad. Okay, so an attack tree is meant to try and get you to think about uh, when you start thinking of all the different angles that you can attack a system, uh, you start realizing that there's more to security than just, you know, uh, secrets that are stored in memory or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, so let's take a few notes about attack tree, then we'll do a simple example. And then after we're going to do the opposite, we're going to do a very advanced uh, attack tree um, to show you really how powerful it is. Okay, so the way I think of it is, I think of it, it's sort of like brainstorming, right? It's not, um, it's not a super formal technique, uh, but there is some structure to it, so I call it structured brainstorming. Say structured brainstorming. You can absolutely use Stride to do this. Uh, so it, it works well with Stride. Stride isn't meant to be used in isolation. or It's not necessarily that you use this and you don't use Stride, or you use Stride and you don't use this. Um, OK, so what you're going to do is you're going to say, I want to do x. I'm an adversary. I shouldn't be able to do x. What are all the different ways that I can do x? OK, and here, because it's just brainstorming, you actually don't really care so much about whether you can actually do it. Right now, it's really, um, so a better name for it uh, is, we call it a threat tree. So sometimes people spend a lot of time distinguishing the difference between a threat and an attack. Um, the way I think of it is, a threat is like, that might work, right? It's a threat, right? An attack is like, it does work. I tried it, it does work, therefore, now it's an attack. It's an actual vector. Uh, here, we actually just want threats, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, in other words, if there's something that might work, but you haven't verified it, you don't know whether it will work for sure, you should include it in your tree, okay? So your tree will be all the different threats, all the things that might work, not all the things that actually work, okay? And once you have all the things that might work, then you try them and you figure out which of them actually do work. Okay. So include all potential threats. not just attacks at work. And then you can evaluate how feasible it is or not, or where do you want to spend your money if you want to defend the system. The objective of structuring your brainstorming in this way, so it's going to be structured as a tree, uh, there's no reason. You could just list all the threats. You'd be like, okay, what are the 10 ways I can attack the system? Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to think of attacks as having a kind of relationship to each other, right? So uh, you have some goal that you want to achieve. You might achieve it by some intermediate goal. So there might be some subset, some sub step to achieving that goal. And then there might be two ways of, of achieving that subset, okay? Step. Uh, so the idea would be that you would have like a root, which is I achieve the goal. I've achieved some step on the way to achieving it. And then there's two ways to achieve that. Uh, so you get this kind of tree-like structure. 
okay? And uh, the idea of the tree is you're also going to think broadly. You're going to think about how, what are all the attacks that are related to what I'm doing? Is there different ways of doing the same thing? Are there three ways of accomplishing the same goal? Uh, and also, like, what are all the totally different ways that I could accomplish this goal, okay? Uh, so you'll think about alternatives and hopefully you'll think broadly about security. So I'll give you an example in a second and you'll see this at play. If you're stuck at attack, so you can use stride. So you can be like, okay, is there anything spoofing that I can do here? Is there, any, is there any way to use tampering? Is there any way I can use repudiation? Is there any way I can use information disclosure, denial of service, escalation of privilege? Um, just like all the other general uh, things, you do need expertise, okay? So it requires you can't sit down and do a tech tree of something you don't know anything about, okay? Um, and so, unfortunately, that's how security works. Uh, if you don't know how it works, you're not going to be able to figure out whether it's secure or not. Um, and the, the final thing, I guess, is also the same as an evaluation framework. It looks super easy, okay? So the structure of it is really easy. Evaluation framework is just a chart. There's just rows. There's just columns. How hard can it be? Well, it's hard because you want to define things precisely. Uh, you have to think through your decisions and those types of things. This is exactly the same way, okay? Looks super easy. You can breeze through it. But when you sit down and you really do a good job, a good job being comprehensive and well thought out, then it actually takes some... Uh, effort in order to do. Um, so structure is easy, execution is hard. Okay, so let's do an example. Okay, this will be a tree. Uh, what defines a tree is it has a root node. So all nodes come from a root. What we're going to put in the root node is a specific attack on a specific system. Okay, So an attack tree or threat tree is not going to find all the security problems with the system. They're actually, you do one tree per possible attack. Okay, So if you're evaluating a system, you might have lots of trees uh, for your system, okay? Uh, so here's an example that's easy enough that we can just think of it on off the top of our head. Um, so this morning I drove in, normally take the train. My car is sitting in the library building, uh, which is a parking garage, okay? Uh, I have a ticket, it's in my pocket. Uh, so when I leave, um, presumably I'm gonna pay like something like $12.50 uh, in order to leave because I came here very early in the morning. All right, now, I actually don't want to pay that money. You guys are going to help me, okay? Uh, so my goal is I want to be able to leave a parking garage without paying. So that's an attack on a system. So the attack is leaving without paying, and the system in this case is the parking garage security infrastructure writ large. Sometimes in this class, we'll actually think about attacking real systems. It's fun when it's real. That doesn't mean you should go out and do it, okay? Uh, you can laugh all you want, but seriously, you know, we're all, uh, we think about ethics. And so just because you can attack a system, uh, you absolutely should not uh, do it. Okay, um, how do I do it? Piggyback. Piggyback, okay. So piggyback, what does that mean? Okay. Okay. So someone else is leaving. 
they're leaving in front of me, they paid. Uh, the arm goes up, they drive through, and I'm gonna tailgate them and drive through riding their bumper all the way, and they will just think it's a long car, it won't think it's two cars, right? Okay, so that's great. So that's an attack, I won't put that in the tree. Now, because this is a tree, what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to just write down attacks as a list. What I'm going to think about is, for that attack, what are the kind of components of that attack? Can we kind of break it down a little bit? And if we break it down, then we might see that there's related attacks, or there's other things that are, are kind of related to it, right? Um, okay, so let's think about this. So I'm tailgating. Um, so first off, someone else is paying. So I'm not paying, so that does achieve the goal. So that's good, it belongs in our tree. Um, and why do I need to tailgate? Because I need the sensor to stay. Uh... Okay, so there's some sensor that I'm tricking, kind yeah. of thing, right? Why is the sensor there? What happens when what what's the, what's the sensor have to do Basically, with anything? It tracks the movement of the object when it crosses a specific brake, and or something happens that closes the gate. Okay, so closing the gate. So that's another thing. So we have a sensor and we have a gate, and so what we're actually doing is we're identifying the defenses. So Another way to approach this is just say, well, why can't I just drive out, right? Like, what's, what's actually stopping me from just directly achieving this goal, right? What's the most immediate thing? And so in this case, this attack has to do with, well, primarily it has to do with this arm, okay? So this arm is blocking me, right? And so that's the thing that's stopping me from directly doing this. So sometimes in a tree, you kind of bounce between What's the, this is what I want to do, what's stopping me? Well, the arm's stopping me. Then you say, well, how do I get around the arm, right? What stops me? And then you say, well, there's the sensor. And then you say, well, how do I get around the sensor? And then eventually, if you go back and forth enough, attack, defense, attack, defense, you will come to a legitimate attack, okay? So let's cluster a bunch of attacks that have to do with like defeating the robotic arm. So we'll pencil this in as a kind of intermediate step. And this works a lot better if you can kind of do it digitally and rearrange it. And I'll show you some software that allows you to do that. Uh, I kind of have an answer that I'm, I'm going for, so I'm going to organize it uh, the way I want. But anyways, um, so we, we can put tailgating here. Okay, so tailgating lets us defeat the robotic arm, and the robotic arm is the thing that uh, is stopping us from just leaving the garage without pain, uh, therefore we can leave, okay? And one thing about attack trees is if you start at a, uh, well, you can go another direction. If you start at a root node and go all the way to a, an actual attack, so an actual attack ends up being a leaf node, it should kind of tell you a story, right? So it's like, I wanna leave the parking garage, but there's this arm that's in the way, so I'm gonna tailgate on someone else. They're, they're opening the arm for me so I can get through, okay? So that's, that's a story, okay? Now the idea of doing a tree is we can back up a node and we can say, okay, there's this robotic arm, it's a problem. Tailgating's one way through the robotic arm. Is there anything else we can do? Is that the only thing that we can think of to defeat a robotic arm that's stopping you? Okay, so we could do something to tamper with it. So this is also where you might think about stride, so tampering something that we have in stride. Okay, so I can hack the controller, the control system that controls the arm. I can give it a command to open, and then it opens and I don't have to pay. What else can I do? Move the and the solution would be to just put a tape on the sensor so you don't have to get in the trouble of you know hacking into it. Okay, so the you idea just close by and you just put a, a tape on the sensor so it's on all the time. Okay, okay. So this is kinda like tailgating, but you're going to stop it. You're not gonna use your car to, to close it, but basically once it opens once you're gonna you're going to interfere with its ability to shut. Okay? And so this is good. So this is in stride, you might think of this as a denial of service. Right. Uh, so what you're doing is you're getting it open and then you're going to DOS it while it's open and then it's going to stay open. You could also like just cut the power, right? Get it open, cut the power, and now it's going to stay open, right? Um, so we'll, let, let's phrase it as a DOS when open. 
so it doesn't close. I could just drive through it. I mean, how strong is it? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Now you will get caught, right? There's security cameras and things like that, but it does it does achieve this goal. Um, okay. Uh, one other thing, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you is. Um, okay. How so? Whoever um, monitoring is um, like in many chains, like in some price. Okay. Okay. So, right. So. Uh, forget about the arm itself. Uh, there is somebody that can open the arm without pain. Okay, you're not the person that can open the arm without pain, but there is somebody in the university that can do that. Okay, so if I can get the arm opened by the person who can open the arm, which is usually the person that's sitting there in the little booth, then that also would be good enough as well. Okay, um, so I can. So let's. We'll have to think about how we're going to do it, but this will be an intermediate node. Um, so what we'll do is we'll attack, not literally, but we'll think about it, attack. Um, operator? Sure. Okay, so not a physical attack, but how do we attack them? Okay, so one thing is social engineering. So we tell a good story about why we need it open. You know, I'm... Uh, I'm here like for the company that makes this or something like that. I need to test it. I don't know. Something, something there. Uh, what else can we do? How, how, is, how is it that the operator actually, how does the operator actually open it? So they usually have a key. Um, and so what can you do with the key? You can steal it. Uh, you can even just get a picture of it. If you can get a picture of a key, most people don't realize it. You leave your keys lying everywhere. If I can get a picture of your key, I can 3D print a key, yeah. and now I have a key. So it's, it's kind of stuff, but it's more of a digital theft. So we'll call that surveilling, or observe key, observation. So let me test my theory, which is it should tell a story. So. Uh, I, my goal is to leave a parking lodge, lot, sorry, parking garage lot without paying. Uh, there's this arm. The arm is stopping me, uh, but the arm has an operator, and the operator has a key, and I'm going to observe the key and then 3D print it. Okay, so that's a story from start to finish of how I just attacked the system, and I accomplished this goal of leaving the parking garage lot without paying. Join the key with which? With the thread. When we put the coin and then after that we can get back the coin. Okay, okay. So so remember that that in order to leave so right now we're focused on this arm as like physically stopping us. But what you're saying is the the goal is also without paying. So maybe we could attack the paying system, right? Like we, we could actually defeat the arm legitimately, right? Like the arm will open if we have a ticket that says to open. How do we get a ticket that says open? We pay, that's the most logical way. Now our goal is to do it without pain. Yeah, so what about coins? Can we, can we do something with the coins, okay? So instead of attacking the arm, we could attack the ticket. Uh, so we could use like counterfeit money in the machine that accepts payment. Uh, the ticket itself, I mean, it has some technology on it. There's a, a magnetic barcode. Presumably, if the right thing gets printed on this magnetic barcode, maybe it's signed, maybe there's some crypto, maybe there's not. Uh, they're probably just assuming that most people don't carry around things that can modify a ma magnetic thing. So I could try and tamper uh, with the card itself.
Okay, so you could steal from someone else. Sure. Uh, we, well, we can think about that. Um, so the sensor, what, how's the sensor? Tell me a story about why the sensor matters. The sensor can be jammed. Okay. Like, like the, robot, the robotic arm is just a physical um, barrier. Yeah. But the sensor is also operating the, the arm itself, so the sensor can be a, an attack vector. You know? Ex absolutely. So I agree 100%. I'm just saying, put that in the context of an attack. Tell me an attack that lets me achieve my goal that somehow involves the sensor. So the tailgating's one, Probably right? I have an RFID. I can just yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I encourage the brainstorming. Yeah, so think, think it through. Probably it's a low frequency. I can jam the frequency of the sensor. No okay, problem. yeah, so, so I could definitely somehow modify the sensor itself. Yeah. But how does that actually achieve the goal? Okay, okay. So if I have to pay for, what happens if I go in the garage, I get a new ticket, I drive around and it's full, and then I leave within five minutes? You don't, you should not pay. I don't pay, it's free, right? It's free for the first five minutes or something like that. So what if I, what if I just get a new ticket, right? So I go in, I have this ticket that I got in the morning. How about before I go and pay, I just walk up to the machine that's giving the tickets out and I press the button and I take a new ticket and then when I leave, I use the new ticket. That doesn't work. You could walk yeah. Okay, why doesn't it work? That's that your answer. Sensor. That's the sensor. Okay, so that's one way that a sensor could factor in. Okay, so my goal is um, I don't want to pay. I have this ticket. I don't want to pay for it. So I want to get a new ticket. But this doesn't work, right? So this is what I want to go. But then there's this defense, and the defense is this weight sensor. Okay, now I can tell a story about what I could do to defeat this sensor. Okay, so if I tamper with the sensor, then I can make it think that there's a car there, even though there isn't a car there. Then I can get a new ticket, and when I have the new ticket, I don't have to pay. Okay, so that's a complete end-to-end -end story uh, that involves the sensor. Uh, I could also, like, maybe when someone else pulls up, I could, like, grab the ticket and run or something <laughs> like that. They don't care. They just back up, and then they pull in. Maybe I have a friend. Right. And so you could do like a kind of um, chain attack where uh, I'm going to leave at the end of the day. My friend's going to come in at the end of the day. Right. And so they get a new ticket. They give me their new ticket. Uh, and then when they leave, there's another friend that's coming in. Right. And so you could just chain that forever. And so maybe the very last person pays for one day, but you could piggyback lots and lots of different uh, people in that. So this, this actually happens in voting in a slightly different context, but they, they call it chain voting. Uh, so you could chain payments. Uh, another thing, let's go back to stride. Um, what's the R in stride? Does anyone remember? Repudiation. Repudiation. What does that mean? All right, so you say something that you didn't actually do. Is, does that apply? Is there any kind of repudiation kinds of attacks? Okay, so what if you go to the operator and you say, you know, actually I paid, uh, but the payment didn't go through or like it didn't work or something like that. Uh, so that could be in terms of social engineering. I already paid. Uh, yeah, they could be. So, so this is questionable whether it works, but it is a threat. So then you have to think about what are the defense mechanisms against it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you drive through it, there's cameras as well. So later we're going to do something with this attack tree, which is going to, we're going to think about how are we going to prevent all of these attacks. Uh, so that's there. I'll tell you one story that happened uh, accidentally. Uh, so I had this in my wallet, and somehow it got bent in my wallet. 
the minute it got bent, uh, it wouldn't read the barcode. Okay, so it wouldn't work. So then I pulled up and I said, I'll pay, but like it doesn't work. And they said, don't worry about it. You know, just go kind of thing, right? <laughs> and so that's something that maybe gets you at once. If every day you show up and you're like, oh, my card bent, uh, maybe that's not going to actually work. Uh, but that's a kind of repudiation uh, kind of attack. Uh, so that's it's all sort of a denial of service too. Like you're you're damaging something that that's a component of the system that's key. Uh, there's also like the terminal that you pay. So you put your ticket in a terminal. The terminal is going to write that you paid onto the ticket itself. You could also t tamper with that that terminal itself. So that's more classically what you would think of in a security course. You could also DOS it. So I've, I've been in the parking garage where it doesn't work, right? The credit card system's down or something like that. What do they do? They just leave the arm open, right? And anyone can leave uh, at that point. Um, yeah, you could jam, jam the slot, for example. That'd be an easy physical thing. Wedge something in there, a piece of paper or something that, that would, would stop people from putting their cards in. And what are they going to do? Um, yeah, or it could be some sort of electronic, you know, cut the power. You could cut the power anywhere in this chart, uh, and it would probably result in the same thing. Okay, so anyways, anyone have any other awesome attacks? Yeah, so you could try and uh, exit through the entrance. Uh, so you would have to assume that there's an arm on both of them. But if there isn't an arm, uh, then certainly you could do that. Um, so we can put that here. So we can either just drive through the arm, or if there's no arm on the entrance, then we could drive through the entrance. If there's an arm, you have to take the ticket. Why? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so you can try and take a new ticket at the entrance. So we covered that uh, here. That's these, this kind of subtree here. Yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. OK, so you could try and steal the money to pay for it using the terminal itself. Uh, so you see this a lot with ATMs uh, where you put a little barcode reader outside the slot where people are putting their cards in. Um, and so this is called skimming. So this one's maybe arguably not part of this attack tree. That's sort of like, how do you steal money in general? And then, but anyways, we'll, we'll keep it here. Anything else? Get a truck. Oh yeah. So so the other thing is, what else? You have the robotic arm, right? You have an entrance. You have an exit. Is there no other way out of the parking garage? What if you just drive through the wall, right? What if you have a helicopter that lifts the roof off the building? You know, like you can get like sort of ridiculous with them, but it's it's actually true. Um, so there's there's also just like the wall. You could drive through the wall. And if you think it's expensive to replace an arm that someone drives through, well, you know, that might be why the arm is so cheap, is so that people don't drive through the wall, because they, they can always just drive through the arm. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So what is escalation privilege? So you're not privileged to leave the garage without paying. So can you find some loophole? where somebody, for example, who is privileged to leave. Um, and so this could fall under social engineering where, you know, if you're maintenance or something like that, then maybe you have privileges. Maybe they don't have to pay. If you take some stickers and you put Concordia and like a serial number on your car and it's white and it's unmarked, it might look like some Concordia vehicle and they would just let it out. Um, uh, it could be, you know, trying to get the key is a kind of escalation of privilege as well. Yeah. 
Okay, other ideas? Yeah, okay, okay, so that's fine. So that's sort of like denial of service. Uh, in this case, they can't, they're not going to wait for everyone to put the thing in, so they might just lift the arm uh, for it. Put it here, alarm. Okay, anyways, okay, so maybe a fun exercise gets you brainstorming, gets you thinking about security, so those are good goals. What else can we learn from this? Uh, so the main point that I want to make with this is this is actually pretty broad. I mean, we're talking about everything from like kind of bribing the human that operates the machine to, you know, the robotics itself. Uh, we have this like kind of chaining attack that doesn't involve any technical sophistication. We have tampering. We could go in lots of nitty gritty detail about what does it mean to tamper. We just sort of stopped with tampering. But like, how do you tamper it? Is it easier to tamper with these cards? How do you circumvent the things that would stop it from tampering? And so this tree could get a lot bigger uh, if you want to do a very thorough job with it. Um, but the main point I want to sort of get you thinking about is that First off, how does it operate? So having this tree structure is useful because you can see that like these two attacks are closer related than say this attack and this attack or whatever the case may be. So attacks are kind of related to each other. Uh, and you can think about what are all the different ways that I can accomplish a goal, okay? So these are kind of, this is why this kind of structure uh, for brainstorming attacks is beneficial. It does something uh, other than just an enumerated list of here's the 10 th attacks that I thought about yesterday when I was thinking about how to attack the system. Okay, what we're going to do next is we're going to do another attack tree. Uh, this time I'm going to do a very thorough job. So I'm going to show you more like what a, a finished attack tree would look like. Uh, the example I'm going to use is something called HTTPS. Uh, so this is if you connect to a website, you'll see HTTPS, you'll see that lock icon. That means you have a secure connection to that website. We'll talk about exactly what that means. We'll do a, a tax tree on how can you circumvent this secure channel, and it will get very, very involved, okay? Uh, so first off, it's going to take us two, maybe three lectures to actually do the attack tree itself. Uh, so there's a lot of things. A lot of that's because I'm going to explain to you how HTTPS works. Uh, so uh, you can't do an attack tree unless if you have domain knowledge. Here we did a pretty good job because we could sort of think about things. This time it's going to be something that's very technical. And so if you don't know about HTTPS, you're not going to think of all the different possible attacks uh, for it. Uh, I'm going to use software to manage the tree just because it's going to get quite large. And yeah, it, it will be a fun exercise. You'll learn a lot about HTTPS. There's a lot of cool stories about security and stuff that are buried into the history of, of thinking about that protocol, okay? Um, so we're going to do that next class. Uh, so this is a nice clean break. We'll end a little bit early. Is there any final questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, so I did not dig up any sample projects from last term. I just forgot about it. Let me take another week and, and I'll... I'll try and think of some examples for next week. Okay. One thing, let me just mention it for your project. You can do an evaluation framework, or that can be a component of your project. So some projects are centered around evaluation frameworks. Maybe it's sort of the warm up to su summarize the literature. Uh, maybe it's the actual end product if you can write, you know, 12 pages or whatever the limit is on one attack tree. So that is an example of projects that you could do. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll see you next week.